Hello, and welcome to today's WJE webinar. My name is Liz Pimper, and I'll be your moderator for this webinar, Five Steps to Longer Roof Service Life. During the next hour, WJE roofing experts Rich Koziel and Edis Oliver will walk through five steps you can take to extend the life expectancy of your roofing systems. By the end of today's presentation, you will understand the fundamentals of maintaining your roofing system, learn roof evaluation steps you can take to save time and money, appreciate how policies and procedures regarding rough system components can impinge on its performance, and go forward with actions that will help you build a more effective roofing management system. WJE is a registered course provider with the American Institute of Architects. You are eligible to receive one AIA CES credit for your participation in today's webinar. Following the presentation, we will send you an email with instructions on how to obtain your credit as well as a link to a recording of the webinar so that you can share today's information with others in your organization. This presentation is copyrighted by Wes Janney Elsner Associates. Now I'll turn it over to Rich to get started. Rich? Thank you, Liz. Today's learning objectives uh, include to learn practical tips to enhance performance and extend the lives of roofs to get the best return on investment, Implement steps to save time and money in the evaluation of your roof. Understand how the various components of your roof system can impinge on roof system performance and to build a more effective management program for your building and roofing system inventory. So with that, hello everyone and welcome to the webinar. This webinar is based on an article that Edison and I authored, which was published in a recent issue of the Building Operating Management uh, publication titled Five Steps to Longer Roof Life. The five steps uh, are a compilation of our opinions and suggestions based on our experiences and lessons learned from working in the roofing industry for over 30 years each. You know, the benchmark life of most low slope roofs in the United States is approximately 20 years based on their warranted life. But the average life, average life of low slope roofs across the United States uh, considering all climate zones in that average, is about 14 years, according to a study, past study by, that was sponsored by NRCA and some of the major roofing material manufacturers. So we advocate periodically inspecting and keeping track of and maintaining your roofs in order to help achieve its maximum service life and to, to be able to reach the warranted life and beyond. We should start with uh, uh, talking about that the roof is simply more than just a roofing membrane. A roofing system uh, includes more than just a membrane. It, it, in order to have a good and thorough grasp of your roofing asset, it is important to have the mindset and understanding that a roofing system includes all of the re related components that make up the, the roof assembly. Uh, that includes features like uh, tie-ins with the interfaces of of the uh, assembly itself or things like mechanical features and equipment and equipment curbs, anything that the roof uh, supports or serves as a platform for. Roofing systems have a finite life expectancy that can vary widely depending upon the climate zone, the solar exposure, the material type, its installation, and a number of other factors. So in order to achieve a good performance, and maximum service life and the best return on your investment, proper care and attention of your roofing system can be realized by exercising good stewardship and performing ongoing maintenance. So step one in the five-step plan that we advocate is to collect and gather together all of the available roofing system data and records. Start your roofing management program by taking and collecting data about the roof, its features and conditions, things like the termination details, the, the drainage scheme, the drain locations, and the mechanical equipment that uh, the roof supports. There are uh, several commercially available software programs to help make managing th this task easier, and that can be linked with tablets and cell phones for greater ease of use and convenience. And we don't advocate any specific one, but we just are pointing out that uh, there are some neat commercially available programs that you can uh, look into and find useful. So here's an example of uh, what we have done and like to use. Uh, it's a 
to collect and record database information. Um, we like to provide a small little summary report that includes a roof plan of the building, uh, maybe an aerial image as well. Um, and then that plan should include the overall dimensions, area tabulations, uh, identify things like the drainage schemes and locations of those drain features, whether or not the slope uh, of the roof is, is in the structure or perhaps in via tapered insulation or some other means uh, or combination of. And then he recorded features like walls that intersect with the roofs, any penthouses, uh, other equipment than uh, enclosures. Here's an example of a format that we've used to collect uh, data and reporting. It, it's a, like a two or three page format and includes a couple of pages of information that show these, these uh, the images of the typical roof areas uh, and, and the recorded information that, that you can collect that can include things about the roofing product type, the name of the manufacturer, the roofing assembly type, the insulation and its thickness, perhaps how the drainage slope is achieved and whether or not that drainage, like I mentioned, was um, um, uh, lacking or, or provided in the structure or tapered insulation. And commentary about the conditions, most importantly about the conditions of the membrane and flashings. And also whether there are any leaks and their approximate locations and brief history about them because if you go back and track and check, you, you could see whether or not repairs that are being made are actually working or you know, solve the problem of the leak. So in regard to data collection, um, I just wanted to point out that also there's, there's some technologies out there that are pretty useful. This is um, an image of a, a RFID tag or radio frequency identification tag. That's a technology that can be useful in some instances uh, uh, for tracking assets and inventory management and whereby digital assets and inventory uh, will be tracked through these encoded tags. It's similar to barcoding uh, data that we see in our grocery stores, but it, it actually can hold a lot more information than a barcode. And what's neat about it is you could use that to not just inventory, but also to update equipment that may get changed or serviced. Um, another uh, important thing to keep in the uh, record, if you will, is uh, warranty documents. Warranty documents should be kept in the maintenance file. These will have the names of the roofing materials manufacturer, contact information, the name of the installing contractor, the size and area under coverage, and limitations about what's covered and what isn't covered in the warranty. So to keep track of maintenance and repair records, remember that conditions can change over time and often do and having accurate and up-to-date information about the current conditions will affect future decisions about maintenance and the repairs that are needed. Mechanical equipment operation is continuously maintained and the curbing that supports the equipment may need repair periodically, particularly if major repair or replacement of the equipment is undertaken. So here's an example of, uh, of a couple of instances that I just talked about. On the left is a uh, air handling unit, a new air handling unit sitting on top of a curb and, uh, and that curb uh, is, is changed in size to accommodate the, the new air handling unit, but the support for the curb, the, the larger outside, let's say the outside black diameter of, around the air handling unit is necessary because that's where the load is transferred and the supporting structure that supports the curb is provided. And so that's like a, like a feature that needs to be accommodated in that instance. The photo on the right is of some roof mounted piping um, insulated piping in the, that supplies air handling equipment and the curbing that supports the piping uh, needed some modification when repairs were undertaken. So again, that's something that could be, uh, is it a change or an upgrade that could be uh, recorded in your uh, documents. So keeping track of those repairs and the building maintenance in general uh, can be easier with the use of a building maintenance software. And as I mentioned, there are several programs av available out there that Edison and I um, are not necessarily advocating or recommending. We just want to point out that if you're doing that, these, these programs offer the benefit of being able to include inspection, repair, and maintenance functions, functions I should say, all in one place, in one convenient and uh, cross-reference location.
So step two in our five-step program is to conduct regular roof inspections or condition assessments on a regular basis. Roof inspections should be performed by knowledgeable persons at least once per year and maybe twice per year and after any major storm event. Detecting and repairing problems early can save money, reduce downtime and damage, and help prevent premature deterioration. And safety is paramount. And so the inspectors should be trained in safety and familiar with OSHA regulations and their requirements, as well as the roofing system conditions being checked or assessed. Here the inspectors are wearing their safety harnesses and would be tied off if they were near the edge or within six feet of the edge, which is like a, an OSHA requirement. And you could see in the distance there that the parapet wall is less than about a foot tall. So uh, when conditions are inspected and problems are observed or identified, you should have repairs made promptly. Sometimes repairs may be included under the warranty terms or they may not be covered or dependent on, depending on the circumstances. Repairs not covered by the warranty should include things like the mechanical damage that we see on the left there. You know, something fell and uh, uh, caused an L-shaped cut uh, from the, the shape of the piece that fell down. And, and that's, yes, that's a, a, a damage and if it detected early can uh, be repaired and patched fairly easily, but if not, uh, detected early, a lot of water can get in through that cut. Um, the base flashing at the skylight frame uh, shown on the right, um, in this instance, the skylight frame was leaking and water entered behind the top edge of the base flashing and entered in an entered here void between the base flashing and cap sheet in this modified bitumen roof system. And that resulted in a water blister. So it became necessary to cut out the entrapped moisture disconnect the fasteners that secure the skylight frame to the curb to be able to raise the skylight frame and then patch the membrane as shown on the left hand or on the right hand side there and secure it to the top of the curb. This is an example of a modified bitumen roof system with granule surface cap sheet. The termination at the parapet walls and building intersections will usually require focused attention because this is where in our experience, leaks usually occur. You can see in the photo on the right, uh, you know, we're, there's a masonry, mass masonry parapet wall with a limestone coping, and the modified bitumen membrane has a surface mounted termination bar. So the masonry above, uh, potentially as, as it weathers, can uh, absorb moisture and invade past the termination. There's a sealant joint at that termination that would need to be maintained from time to time, but just not that sealant joint with the termination bar because there is no through wall flashing in this, in this instance, but the masonry itself could be uh, potentially leaking. So it's important to keep the condition of the masonry in good condition and pointed to keep moisture from entering. Similarly, with the coping at the top, there are uh, joints between, as you can see, there, there's been some repair to those joints because they had been a leak um, uh, condition and um, it's something that needs to be maintained and sealed from time to time not not particularly related to the roof or the roof roof installation but it's something that will impact the roof here's another example of, of a similar condition we have a rooftop skylight that rests on a curb and there's a modified bitumen roof base flashing that turns up and is counter flashed by a sheet metal um, counter flashing that is used for both the roofing and, and skylight flashing systems. And so thermal movement between these two elements can cause some stress and require replacing the sealant joints from time to time. And the, the, the photo on the right is, is an example of uh, having to take off the counter flashing to be able to access those sealant joints. In this instance, uh, we had, uh, there was water infiltrating from the skylight the modified bitumen membrane wasn't completely wrapped over on top of the curb and water was able to get in behind the modified bitumen membrane to look as though it was a roof leak when in fact it was actually a skylight. Here's an example of something that may be insurance related that would, let's say, not be covered necessarily by the warranty, but it may be an insurance claim. This is an adhered membrane that lost adhesion from wind damage. It's a TPO membrane. It became detached by the wind, uh, but then also because of pressurization from within the building and 
there not being an adequate seal, air barrier seal between the, the roof deck and the wall allowed pressurization from inside the building to come up into the roof and then inflate uh, beneath the membrane that was adhered to cause it to become to, uh, uh, inflated, as you can see in the photo on the right. Safety-related additions and modifications or improvements to existing building roofs has been a prominent addition and building feature the past several years, primarily because of OSHA fall protection regulations. OSHA regulations require that a, all protection anchorages be able to resist a minimum of 5,000 pounds per attached worker in any direction that the anchorage can be used to arrest the fall. WJ has a lot of experience with this uh, and gets involved with design, installation, and testing of fall protection systems for all types of roofs. The photos on the left show a tie-off anchor with base plate installed within a localized opening in a ballasted thermoplastic membrane, roof membrane. The anchorage location would get filled in with rigid insulation and the membrane patched later on. But prior to the repair being patched and sealed, our structural engineers shown in the photo on the right are proof testing that anchorage to be sure that what was installed is capable of safely uh, supporting and resisting 5,000 pounds. And this is, this is commonly, we see this a lot in, in let's say, existing uh, buildings that don't have this and, and the owners want to have this added in. So it requires oftentimes, you know, a lot of penetrations and openings in the deck to install these anchors and then patch repairs. And sometimes there's mismatch between, uh, you know, the, the imagine doing this on a 20 year old roof or 15 year old roof. It, it makes you wonder whether it would be uh, economical to, to make all those openings at that time or perhaps uh, install them in conjunction with a roof replacement. So at this point, I'd like to turn over the presentation to Edis Oliver. Thank you, Rich. The purpose of the inspections that uh, Rich has talked about is to enable us to schedule appropriate maintenance and repair work. And the first step to scheduling work is to recognize that there are, there are two types of maintenance. The first is breakdown maintenance, and the second is scheduled maintenance. Breakdown maintenance occurs whether it's on your car, your air conditioner, or a roof. Breakdown maintenance is when you wait until the, the roof leaks in order to make a repair. Scheduled maintenance is when we schedule the maintenance for our own convenience. So the first step in moving ahead is selection of a good roofing contractor. WJ recommends that one of the very best sources to select a good roofing contractor is the National Roofing Contractors Association. The NRCA is one of the oldest trade organizations in the United States, over 150 years old, and is composed of about 4,000 of the best roofing contractors in the United States. And uh, we've shown their web page on the slide there. You can go to their web page and uh, search for the best roofing contractors or the member contractors in your locale. And we think that's a really good place to start. Having a good roofing contractor is probably one of the most important things you can do. Now, if you have multiple facilities, then you may want to have more than one roofing contractor because roofing contractors get busy in peak periods. And from time to time, it's necessary uh, to use more than one contractor, depending on the load of work that you have. There's a vast difference in roofing contractors between having a good, responsible roofing contractor and having a poor roofing contractor. There are a lot of roofing contractors out there that are not qualified to do work on uh, com large-scale commercial roofs. The benefit of scheduling maintenance, and the reason we focus on that term so much, is that when you schedule maintenance, you're able to do that for your convenience. And that may be seasonal convenience, it may be the, for the convenience of your tenants, depending on what's going on in the building, or it may be because you have to have some mechanical equipment uh, shut down for a period of time. In which case, it's very important to be able to schedule that work not only for your convenience, but 
for the convenience of your tenants and your occupants. Um, one of the things in, that's very important in scheduling maintenance is making sure that the contractors are performing that work in accordance with the manufacturer's published direction for those particular types of roofs. There are many different kinds of commercial roofs these days, from modified bitumen roofs to built-up roofs to single-ply roofs that are uh, thermoplastic olefin or polyvinyl chloride roofs. And the contractors are not all skilled in every type of roof. So making sure that you have a contractor is skilled and has the resources to perform maintenance work on a particular type of roof is very important. Having your work done in a timely manner is important as well. Making sure that that work is being done before, it uh, before a deficiency or a distress causes additional damage uh, is very important to the long-term life of the roof. Uh, if, if a repair is necessary, and it's not performed timely and we get a heavy rain or heavy or high winds, additional damage can be done to the roof uh, caused by delaying uh, that work. So having it done in a, in a timely manner can have a big impact not only on the long-term service life, but your costs and your budget. One of the most important things in scheduled maintenance is regularly scheduled cleaning and housekeeping on the roof. It's a, that's an underappreciated activity and it's very inexpensive. Just such things as cleaning leaves and trash and debris off of roofs. And as you'll see a little bit later in this presentation, the importance of controlling access to the roof and making sure that uh, the people working on the roof are not leaving additional trash and debris on the roof. Trash and debris on the roof can clog drains, as you can see in the photograph on the right, and clogged drains can cause water to pond. And when water's standing on the roof, the probability of leaks is enhanced and can even in certain extreme circumstances lead to a collapse of the roof. As Rich has already discussed in terms of collecting data, it's also not important. It's also important not only to collect the data, but to maintain the data as you go along. So as you have contractors perform maintenance and repair work on the roofs, it's also very important that you maintain an accurate record of those repairs. The benefit of that is it helps you budget for the future, and it also helps you to understand what types of roofs are performing the best for you and which buildings may be in need of replacement soonest. So having those records is not only just a simple record keeping tool, so you have a record, it's an outstanding planning tool for your future work over the long term. Because the purpose of this program that we're talking with you about today is extending the service life and making sure that we are able to extend the service life of our roofs up to the full 20 years or beyond of the benchmark life of the roofs and not having to replace them at 14 years as is so common around the United States. The next module that I want to discuss is the importance of controlling access to the roof. This is closely related to scheduled work. Too often, owners allow any contractor to come throw a ladder up beside the building and climb up on the roof to repair or do maintenance work. And that may not only be a roofing contractor, but it may also be mechanical contractors. And so we're going to be talking now about, about not only selecting a top-notch roofing contractor, but controlling who is allowed to go on the roof and access the roof and work on the roof. Now, one of the axioms in roofing is that Roofs don't tend to leak out in the open field of the roof, what we call the flat or low slope open field of the roof. Roofs tend to leak around discontinuities in the roofing system. Discontinuities are when the plane of the roof is broken by either roof edges, walls, changes in elevation to a, from a lower roof to a higher roof, expansion joints, roof drains, and most importantly of all, penetrations in mechanical equipment. Those are the things that are most likely to create roof leaks. And when we're scheduling maintenance, those are the things that we first need to focus our maintenance on, is these seven things or six things that I've listed. 
And I'm going to just show you some examples of what happens when you don't have a high, highly qualified and you have not gone through a proper selection process in your roofing contractors, the kinds of haphazard repairs that you can end up with. So these are, these are repairs at discontinuities in the roof. The one on the left is a repair to an expansion joint. That expansion joint happens to be down in the floodplain of the roof. So a puncture in that expansion joint, that haphazard repair, is going to result in water entering the building. On the right is a properly installed and maintained expansion joint, which is elevated out of the floodplain of the roof. And as you can see, it has a metal cap on top with a standing seam, so water is not going to leak in at the joints or the seams. A further discontinuity is where roofs are intersected, intersect walls. On the left is a, is a base flashing, which has come loose and collapsed. Now, we would expect to pick that up in our inspection, and we would expect to incorporate that in our scheduled repair. And on the right is a, is a properly maintained and uh, properly installed base flashing on a masonry wall. You can see the difference. In one case, the base flashing is falling off the wall because probably the owner has not inspected it in recent years. He only ins he's only inspecting when that fills up with water and starts pouring into the building. So again, we're inspecting and making our repairs at these discontinuities. A further uh, condition that we find often is lack of proper access to the roofs. We have an axiom in the roofing business that says that roofs that are accessible get maintained and roofs that are inaccessible do not get maintained. When the worker has to climb up on three, three or four milk cartons to get up on the roof, he's not as likely to go up on that roof and perform maintenance work as if he has a nice set of steps or crossovers leading from one roof elevation to another. Obviously, the, uh, the installation on the right is safer, and it also prevents damage to the roof from the short, sharp corners of those milk cartons pressing into the base flashing of the roof. Electrical conduit is another penetration and mechanical equipment that's one of those discontinuities. Oftentimes, we don't think about the fact that the electrical work on the roof can dramatically affect the performance of the roof. But when we have all of this electrical work haphazardly installed and uncontrolled by random contractors in what looks like a spaghetti fashion, compared the one with the one on the right, which is well organized with all the conduit organized on portable pipe hangers, lifted up out of the floodplain of the roof, collected and directed into the, into the roof uh, uh, access panel, you can see the obvious difference. Which roof is likely to have more problems or leaks? Mechanical equipment. Again, as we're talking about the importance of controlling the access to the roof, this is what happens when we don't have controlled access. We strongly recommend that the contractor that you select must go through some sort of a check-in system in order to get on the roof. We strongly recommend that you control access to the roof, you control who the roofing contractor is, and you control who the mechanical contractor is, as well as the electrical contractor. Again, you can see the difference when we have random contractors going on the roof that are not necessarily approved by you, the owner. We talked about drainage. Rich touched on the point of drainage. Here's a case, of, again, of housekeeping. You'll notice the drain uh, is clogged and obstructed by vegetation on the uh, left-hand side and water standing on the roof, which enhances the probability of a roof leak as compared with the roof on the right, where there's a clean and clear overflow and primary drain. So, as we kind of look over this, which roof would you rather have? Which roof do you think is more likely to be a trouble-free roof? The roof on the left with a lot of disorganized mechanical equipment, or the roof on the right with wall pads around the mechanical equipment, all of the equipment raised out of the floodplain of the roof, the conduit, the electrical conduit, and the piping all organized in a, uh, in, a, in a tightly organized manner on portable pipe hangers. So the point of this particular module of our presentation 
is to indicate that it's very important, we believe, that you select the roofing contractor that gets to work on the roof. And that's particularly true of those of you that own retail property and are leasing space to tenants. Too often we find situations where owners of retail properties sign leases with their tenants where the owner or, or the owner or the property manager assumes control of the enclosure of the building and the tenants are responsible for their own equipment. Oftentimes these same tenants, uh, perhaps uh, uh, they lease the, the, the space to a pizza parlor and the owner of the pizza, pizza joint comes in and puts new air conditioning and kitchen equipment in there. He hires his own plumber, his own mechanical contractor, come out and drill holes in the roof, flash all that equipment with some uh, unapproved methodology, and then the roof leaks, and he calls the property manager and says, hey, the roof leaks in this new space I just leased. And the owner of the property manager ends up paying for the repairs that were caused by the tenant because the owner did not maintain adequate control over the roof. So we recommend that particularly in those cases like that, that you, the owner, select the roofing contractor and require all of your tenants, in the case of retail property, to use your roofing contractor and use only flashing and mechanical details that you have approved. This is another example of properly flashed curb, a curb that was installed and then properly flashed. Okay, these are modifications that are made after roofs have been installed. And of course, this is just reinforcing the point of making sure that you are in control of the roofing contractor working on your roof and not letting someone else decide who the roofing contractor is on your roof. Most of these roofs, and many of your roofs, may be under warranty. It's also important to know that the roofing contractor you've selected is authorized by that particular manufacturer holding the warranty to work on that particular roof because of an unapproved or unauthorized roofing contractor, one that's not certified by the roofing material manufacturer, starts working on the roof, it can cause issues with whether or not the manufacturer is going to honor that warranty or not. In other words, the manufacturer may not honor the warranty if work has been done on the roof by an unauthorized or unapproved roofing contractor. So it's important to make that link between the roofing contractor and the manufacturer and be sure both are, uh, do business with each other. There are many other types of things that you're going to find on your roofs that have to be addressed. Security cameras and security arrangements are very important. Oftentimes, it's important for you to be sure that the people working on your roof have gone through the proper security procedures uh, to be authorized to work up there and then down to the individual personnel with criminal background checks. So that's required by many owners nowadays. So as, uh, as we discussed earlier, uh, making sure that the flashing details that are being used on your roofs are those approved by the roofing material manufacturer and the industry. The National Roofing Contractors Association has published many, many outstanding manuals showing the preferred ways in which uh, flashing details should be constructed for all various types of conditions that are likely to occur on the roof. And these are well-known and well-established details that have been uh, proven throughout the industry for, in many cases, as much as 40 years. So this concludes the section on scheduling and implementing maintenance and repairs and controlling access to the roofs. And I may, have, I may have bounced back and forth a little bit, and that's because these two items are closer, closely interlocked and interrelated. The, the importance of selecting a good contractor and scheduling the work and focusing on those areas where the roofs are most likely to leak first in your scheduled and planned maintenance is the key to long-term service life. So I'm gonna hand this back to Rich now for the fifth module. Thanks, Edis. So the, the fifth module or fifth step in our program is to use technology, and I, and I parenthetically state that effectively because that's an important distinction. There are diagnostic technologies and test methods available out there that can be employed to 
help provide useful and accurate information about the condition of, of insulated roof systems. However, these technologies and test methods are only tools. They're, they're, just as, they're only as good as, as, as the, the people who are using them. They don't replace skilled and knowledgeable people who know the principles behind the technologies and test methods. And more importantly, know and recognize the nuances involved in the limitations, especially the limitations. Knowing what will not work and why and being able to utilize and apply that knowledge correctly makes all the difference uh, in an assessment being accurate or wrong. Additionally, there are ASDM standards in place for many of the technologies and test methods, and I'll show some of those in, in the upcoming slides, that can be referenced and or followed as good practice guidelines. The first is infrared technology. And uh, you can see there's an AS practice standard up there, C1153. Infrared Im imaging, or IR, as it's commonly called, uh, uh, is a diagnostic tool to aid in the assessment of roofing system conditions and help with maintenance, programming, and planning. An experienced professional undertaking the scan and interpreting the information is imperative, though. The IR camera uses thermal imaging, or sometimes called thermography, to detect temperature differences of a surface or object and reveals or highlights those differences through the area's alive uh, image. So if insulation is wet under the roof system and that insulation, uh, actually wet insulation will have more mass and a slower rate of heat transfer than does, let's say, dry insulation, the wet insulation will gain and lose heat more slowly than dry insulation, assuming the same insulation material uh, that we're talking about or comparing. So we advocate performing the thermal scan in conjunction with a, with a different test method or test type um, to check and to back check the survey to also be done in con conjunction with inspection openings to, uh, in strategic locations to check and confirm that what's being shown is actually uh, what, what is being revealed as a thermal difference. So this other technology that uh, we think is, is a good one and advocate is a capacitance meter uh, or capacitance technology. These are photos of a capacitance meter. On the left is a handheld uh, capacitance meter and on the right is the same type meter. It just has wheels and, and a larger footprint to, to roll across the roof surface. Um, and these capacitance meters are sometimes referred to or called um, impedance meters and the practice guideline for performing a survey using these meters is ASTM D7954. Um, th these meters test the roof surface using an electrical current that passes through a low frequency electric signal into the roof from rubber electrodes that are located on the bottom of the meter. The meter de detects if a location beneath is wet by completing an electric cir circuit so at dry locations, the electric circuit is not completed and hence no signal to read or detect. They cannot, uh, the meters cannot tell or determine the percentage of moisture present, just if the area immediately below the meter is either wet or dry. They work really well on modified bitumen membranes, uh, asphalt membranes, and thermoplastic membranes. They don't work on EPDM membranes because EPDM is conductive. So when performing roof assessments, like I mentioned previously, we like to use technologies in combination to back check the reading. So depending on the conditions or type of roofing system, we might use an IR camera as a primary test method and then back check that with a capacitance gauge or vice versa with the capacitance gauge as the primary test method. So the photo on the left shows an IR image of a roof with surface temperatures. You can see on the right hand side, there ranges from 31 to 63 and in the center is the, the let's say, the, the cursor or the spot check, and off to the left is, is a vent stack. So all of the yellow highlighted areas are shaded are actually uh, warmer, uh, and the, the dark, darker are cooler. So one would think, oh, wow, we have some moisture in this roof, perhaps, at the yellow highlighted areas. But that's not necessarily the case. It's just showing a the thermal image. It's not telling us that there's moisture there. 
we would have to uh, make an inspection opening at that location to confirm whether in fact we're seeing um, um, moisture there or not because these cameras are so sensitive they could read within one degree Fahrenheit uh, temperature differential. And now on the right hand side it shows a photograph of a capacitance meter directly on top of a board of insulation and we like to check that uh, uh, or calibrate it, if you will. We like to calibrate the, the roof on every project that we work on to be able to, to be sure that what we're, knowing, what we're seeing is you know, the type of assembly that there may be multiple layers of insulation. We would need to know whether or not the insulation is tapered or not. All that's gonna make a difference and knowing that through test cuts will help us to, to be able to more precisely and correctly uh, interpret what we're seeing with the camera. So here's an example of what I was just saying, the inspection openings. They're made to determine the actual as-built construction of the roof, but also to help quantify the moisture content uh, within it if there is any uh, wet insulation. And we like to take them at low, medium, and high readings to help calibrate those findings. When uh, insulation is wet, it loses its thermal and structural integrity, and each type of insulation has a separate percentage of moisture content at which point it loses its thermal and structural integrity. And, and there are things that we would do to follow up. I wouldn't necessarily go in, in more detail here, but the samples of the insulation can be bagged and brought back to a laboratory and, and precisely measured in, in the laboratory for the actual moisture content to be help calibrate it even more accurately. Then there's technology that is uh, referred to as electronic leak detection in both high voltage and low voltage uh, formats, which I'll show on the next slide. But electronic leak detection technology in general and in simplified terms involves creating a conductive electric field over the roof surface, grounding the test equipment to structure, and having a non-conductive membrane function as an insulator. If there's a breach in the membrane, the electric field grounds itself to the structure. So the electronic leak detection in both the is or also sometimes referred to as integrity testing in both high and low voltage test methods is pretty popular and can provide accurate results but there are also some limitations to it and knowing what those are is really important providing a detailed and meaningful description about ELD testing methodology is beyond the scope of this presentation today we just want to point out that there are individuals and firms that specialize in performing this testing and having someone with a lot of experience in doing the testing and interpreting the, interpreting the information is essential. I, will, I would just say that I was involved in one case once where um, all the test information from the project came back and showed that there was no problem with the membrane. In fact, there wasn't any. But there were a lot of leaks around roof drains and penetrations for anchors uh, supporting some planters. And those anchors had to be excluded from the testing because they would have been a a point where there would have been, uh, you know, the electrical uh, check would have been interfered with, and so those could not be tested. Uh, they could have been tested perhaps with some spray testing or some flood testing, but they were excluded for the, from the testing, so the, the information came back that the, 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 the membrane was fine. In fact, it was fine, but the flashings were not fine, and they did, in fact, leak. Here's an example of uh, the low-voltage leak detection test methodology. Uh, it requires wetting the surface with water to provide an electrically conductive medium. The person using the test equipment shown in the photo at right is checking to detect uh, the electric current flow. So by moving the probes he has in his hands there in a systematic manner, he's able to follow the current flow and literally able to pinpoint the breach to even a small size such as a pinhole. Another technology that we uh, frequently use is, is drones. Drones are very useful and they're significantly impacting and, and helping in the way in which inspection and monitoring work is performed today. There are uh, uh, FAA rules and regulations that apply to the use of drones and uh, we're familiar with them and we have, in fact, FAA certified drone pilots experience in the various sizes, type of drones and systems uh, for performing roof surveys as well as, as well as wall inspections too. They work very well in cases involving difficult access buildings or structures. 
They can be equipped with high resolution camera or, or videography or even nighttime thermal imaging cameras. Um, the, the nighttime imaging or FLIR camera can capture, or IR camera can capture images that can be post-processed for analysis and reporting. And um, there, you could see in this photograph, we're surveying a, a building in Cleveland and for, for walls uh, and roofs, as well as uh, uh, just an exterior survey to see if there are any air infiltration problems with the facade. And you could see the, the thermal image on the left is, is a close up of the facade there. And these are just some shots of how the drone, you know, uh, is being used from a nearby uh, flat roof deck by our, one of our inspectors. So. Uh, this technology is a great technology, but there are some regulations you need to be aware of and uh, requires the skills of the pilots and, and the people inter interpreting the information as well. Uh, but it is, uh, is really a, a nice thing to use in difficult reach or tough access uh, situations. So at this point, um, I'm going to conclude with module five and turn it over to Edis to complete and summarize the presentation. Thank you, Rich. Uh, to wrap up, our five steps are collecting the roof data and uh, good, having good records, uh, conducting regular roof inspections, uh, as Rich said, uh, at the very minimum annually, but preferably twice a year after the hottest weather and after the coldest weather and after any uh, weather event. Uh, third, selecting a top-notch contractor. We recommend searching the NRCA webpage to get the top quality contractors for, for your area, but getting a professional contractor and scheduling maintenance, not waiting for breakdowns or waiting for leaks. Finally, controlling roof access, not only from your roofing contractor, but your mechanical contractors, your electricians, your security camera people, everyone that's gonna be on your roof should be an approved person and you should be approving the work that they do. And finally, using the technology effectively that is available to you. So that concludes, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, hand it back to Liz, who will open it up now for questions. Are you gonna, am I gonna do these first? Yep. Okay. okay, thank you, Edis. As a reminder, if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A box and hit send. And if we don't get to your question during the call, we will follow up with you afterward. So let's go ahead and take our first question. Should yearly or semi-annual roof maintenance include the use of the thermal scan or capacitance meter? Okay, uh, I'll take that one. Um, so I would say the answer is it, that depends, not necessarily. Um, I think that, um, if, if you have, uh, if it's an older roof, perhaps you might uh, do that. But I would say, I think I would rely on first the visual inspection to kind of let me know whether I should be clued into something more detailed and uh, uh, diagnostic checking involving the either the infrared or uh, capacitance meter. But it wouldn't take a lot of effort to do that either. So it could be done fairly straightforward. I'm just saying it doesn't have to be done that way. If you just, just did a visual, in, in the course of doing your visual check, you see something, you say, I, you know, I think we should uh, look into this a little further. It's not that much more of a step to uh, come prepared and do the uh, infrared and the, uh, and the capacitance meter. The other thing is, when you see something, the weather conditions may not be conducive to doing an infrared check or a capacitance check. If there's ponding on the roof, you're not going to get meaningful results, or if there's a, um, you know, some moisture, or there's a moisture essentially, you may want to come back at a time when the roof surface is dry to be able to get good information out of your scan. Okay, we'll take the next question. Which design professional is best suited to design and oversee roof projects, a plumbing engineer or architect? Well, I would recommend, uh, it, it, certainly plumbing engineers are very capable of designing roof drainage systems and they understand uh, flow rates and rainfall rates. Uh, some architects are, are very well qualified. 
I think I would recommend going to the uh, web page of the Roof Consultants Institute. It's actually abbreviated RCI. Going to the uh, RCI, and those are uh, th those are certified or registered roof consultants. These many of these are architects. There are many engineers, but they are all people who uh, specialize in roofing. So that would be my recommendation: is to go to the uh, RCI. Uh, RCI webpage on the internet, and you can get a li list of the uh, uh, roof consultants across the nation. That'd be my recommendation. Okay, our next question. On low slope roofs, how do you determine whether rigid insulation is damaged, as in hail impact, and warrants replacement, and what criteria is used to make that determination? Boy, that's a good and tough question. <laughs> uh, I'll say that. Um, First, I would want to know whether the roof system is adhered or, or not adhered. It might be mechanically fastened. Um, and the type of, type of roof uh, membrane on top of the insulation and the type of insulation. But generally speaking, um, if uh, the roof is an adhered roof, like for example, an adhered EPDM or adhered TPO or adhered thermoplastic membrane, PVC, whatever, uh, uh, and the there's a I would want to know whether there's covered board beneath it or not. I would be looking to see whether the uh, facer on the insulation uh, has been affected, whether that uh, that membrane is directly adhered to the insulation or to the cover board. I'd want to know how that uh, has been done, and the way to check that would be through inspection openings. It'd be difficult to ascertain that easily simply by making a visual inspection. There may be some some dents, perhaps visible. But to really understand uh, the, the extent of damage, you'd have to do destructive openings um, and perhaps do some follow-up laboratory testing. Okay, our next question. What is your opinion of in-plane roof expansion joints in PVC roofing? Okay, this is Edis, I'll answer that. Uh, not much. Uh, I have a very low opinion of any in-plane uh, expansion joint. Uh, I think all expansion joints should be in, uh, similar to almost all penetrations. They should be raised out of the flood plane of the roof. And the reason for that is any, if, if it's in the flood plane of the roof or in the plane of the roof and there's a puncture, then there's a much, much higher probability that water will penetrate through that expansion joint. Okay. This question is, um, Ponding water areas, how can these be dealt with on flat roofs? It seems like there's no way to get rid of these. Okay. That's a, also a very good question. You know, ponding, um, the definition of ponding is there's been a longstanding uh, accepted industry uh, definition. I think it was uh, begun by the National Roofing Contractors Association years ago. But uh, th I think this question used to come up a lot and still does. Um, you know, what, what is ponding? And so the industry has accepted the fact that the ponding is, is water that remains on the roof surface uh, 48 hours following an event of precipitation. So if, if a ponded area dries out within 48 hours, technically it wouldn't be considered a, a ponded area. But um, uh, how do we, what is the best way to, 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 to get rid of it? Um, that becomes very difficult in some some cases. Uh, you might be able to fill in the region, well, with a look in a localized manner with some insulation and membrane to help displace the ponding. You may not get rid of it, but you may be able to displace it to the extent that uh, uh, it, it would dry out within the 48 hours uh, time frame. Um, if possible, when you're uh, re-roofing the building. Uh, you could take that area into consideration and either you know, add additional insulation in the area or increase the slope um, in that area or perhaps uh, add a, a supplemental drain if that's possible even from below. But sometimes we, we oftentimes are forced into situations like that. That can be in a, a cost-effective solution is to add a supplemental drain, but that requires having access from the underside and being able to tie into the plumbing uh, from below. And so it requires a just one by one analysis and assessment. Um, okay, 
Our next question is, are roof davits typically part of the biannual roof inspection? Uh, yes, they generally are. Now, when we talk, when we say inspection, there's two, two levels of inspection. Inspection to see if they're properly flashed or they're, they're a penetration. So uh, doing a visual inspection of whether they're properly flashed or not would be normally what you would include in the annual inspection. Now, actually testing the davits is a whole different thing, and that would not ordinarily be included in a regular roof inspection. It should be done on a periodic basis. Testing those is required on a periodic basis, but, that, but the actual testing of the davit would not be part of a routine roof inspection. Okay, we have time for a few more questions. This one says, are there circumstances where the colder areas, areas of a roof may be more of the target for investigating areas of moisture versus the warmer temperatures? Well, that's an excellent question. Uh, certainly that's one of the things that can be uh, investigated through infrared, uh, through an IR inspection is to, is to, to be able to determine which of those areas are the colder areas and then investigate them for potential moisture, uh, the presence of moisture. Second, colder roofs are more brittle and therefore more likely, they're more, they're more su uh, subject to damage from impact. The colder roof is, the more brittle, it's more subject to, uh, or su uh, susceptible to hail damage or damage from impacts. So uh, I think it's certainly fair to say that a cold roof uh, should be evaluated probably by infrared and, and likely be inspected more thoroughly or more often. So that's a great question. Okay, our last question for today. What are the most effective ways to help identify moisture located in roof decking, truss systems, roof cavity, cavities, et cetera, during a due diligence process when invasive testing cannot be used? Well, that's an excellent question. And we, we're faced with that a lot, uh, all the time when we're doing those due diligence inspections. And that becomes you know, a, a challenge sometimes. I would say that first thing I, I guess I'd like to, to ask uh, uh, the, the parties or entities I'm working with or for, uh, uh, look at the records. Uh, I'll, I'll be able to look at the the records to see if there have been leaks in the records, if there have been repairs, what those repairs have been. I certainly would bring an IR camera with me, even though I wouldn't be able to uh, make, let's say, inspection openings. That may be able to give me some some good insight and suspicions about it. I'd be looking for evidence of of uh, leak stains. Um, I definitely would first do an interior inspection and check on the underside, uh, especially on the underside of the roof deck and at walls, because uh, if there have been problems, you know, you'd see them in the form of stains, uh, some telltale signs, uh, but it does become tricky uh, for that reason. For example, I, uh, one problem that I would encounter a lot with uh, built up roofing is if you look at a, a built up roof, in wintertime, and that roof is blistered, you're not going to see those blisters in winter. And I don't know how to get around that easily other than to say that you're looking at the roof in wintertime, and then you write into your assessment that there could be some instances of blistering, for example, that, uh, that should be checked during warmer conditions to see if there are blisters present, because you're not going to be able to tell by looking in November and December in a northern climate zone. Um, but it's, it's an excellent question, and it's it's sometimes a difficult one to get your hands around, and all I could say is I would check the records as best I can and look for the telltale signs. I would definitely do an infrared scan and probably a capacitance meter scan just as a, as a back check, not being able to make openings, and then tell somebody if I'm suspicious about those locations having or holding water. Okay, thank you, Rich, and thank you, Edis. That is all the time that we have for questions today. As I said before, if we didn't get a chance to answer your question live during the webinar today, Rich and or Edis will follow up with you afterward to address your question. We'd really like to thank you all for joining us, and we hope it's been educational. As a reminder, we will send you an email with instructions to receive credit for your participation in today's webinar, and that email will also have a recording of the webinar for you to share with your colleagues. So again, we really appreciate your time, and we hope you have a great rest of the day.